Hi class, welcome to our discussion of part two of the urinary system. Part one focused primarily on an overview of the urinary system and the structures, the anatomy of the urinary system. This part two is going to focus is going to focus primarily on the physiology of the urinary system and some of the um, disease states that can occur, some of the homeostatic imbalances that can occur. So first, let's focus on how we make urine with the little filters we have in our kidneys, those nephrons, those structural and functional filters of the kidneys. If you look very closely at the glomerular capsule, sometimes, excuse me, the renal corpuscle, the renal corpuscle is broken up into a glomerular capsule, which is on the outside, and then a glomerulus, which is the ca leaky capillary bed on the inside. And we have lots of water leaking out of the bloodstream, urea, which is a nitrogenous waste, glucose, which is blood sugar, we typically want to keep that in our bloodstream, and amino acids, which again, we typically want to keep in our bloodstream, but then uric acid and salt can also leak out of the blood into the from the glomerular capsule into the glomerulus and enter into the liquid known as the filtrate. And right here in the glomerulus, at the very beginning of the nephron, the filtrate is almost identical in chemical composition to the blood plasma. The major difference is the blood plasma has larger dissolved proteins that are stuck in the blood plasma and cannot pass through the, the capillary bed that is inside of the glomerular capsule. Those larger proteins in the blood plasma cannot pass from the glomerulus into the filtrate. Once we get to the pro once we go from the, the glomerulus, uh, the pressure of the fluid buildup within the glomerula glomerular capsule will push the filtrate into the proximal convoluted tubule. And while we're in the proximal convoluted tubule, we will have lots and lots of tubular reabsorption. We'll almost reabsorb all of the glucose and amino acids in the proximal convoluted tubule. We'll also have a little bit of reabsorption of so salts and reabsorption of water in our proximal convoluted tubule. As we go from the proximal convoluted tubule to the loop of Henle, or if you're more new school and not crusty like I am, the loop of nephron, we'll have lots of reabsorption of water in the descending loop and salts in the ascending loop. And as we are reabsorbing these chemicals from the filtrate, they go directly back into the bloodstream. So during tubular reabsorption, we go from the filtrate to the blood. We also have a lot of tubular secretion occurring. Tubular secretion is when we go from the blood to the filtrate. This is when, when we dump specific chemicals into the filtrate against their concentration gradients. This is going to be an active process and it's going to require the input of ATP, the input of cellular energy. After we get to after we're done with the loop of nephron, we'll move to the distal convoluted tubule and we'll continue this processing where we have some tubular reabsorption, tubular secretion occurring, and then we get to the collection duct or collecting duct. And during this process, or at the very end of the collecting duct, we've gone from a nice light colored liquid, blood plasma, to a darker concentrated liquid known as urine. And this urine will have high concentrations of water. It is mostly water after all. but it will also have lots of urea, uric acid, salts, ammonia ions, and creatine chemical compounds present. So let's focus on those main processes of urine formation. We have glomerular filtration, reabsorption, or tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. During glomerular filtration, we are going to have lots of chemicals that can leave the bloodstream, but those larger plasma proteins and the blood cells cannot leave the bloodstream. They are the non-filterable blood components. So we'll have the small molecules that and water molecules go from the blood and enter into the glomerulus, excuse me, enter into the glomerular capsule, and then it'll be, that liquid is known as the filtrate, and it'll move from the glomerular capsule to the proximal convoluted tubule. Within the, both the proximal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule, and the other tubes, all collectively referred to as renal tubules, we can have tubular reabsorption and secretion taking place. We will typically reabsorb most of the water that enters our, our urinary tract. We will produce approximately 50 liters of filtrate every single day, but only urinate out about 2 liters of urine. On a given day so in, or one to two liters depending on how much we're drinking and our kidney function in other words we reabsorb the vast majority uh, over 90 percent of the water that enters into 
the nephrons, because we want to keep that water in our body so we don't become dehydrated. So the biggest, most important thing to reabsorb is water. We'll also reabsorb some important nutrients and some required salt ions. Some things that we don't reabsorb though are other water molecules. We don't reabsorb everything. If we reabsorb too much water, our urine will become too concentrated and we'd be at, be at increased risk of developing kidney stones, which are definitely not a good thing to develop. Tubular secretion is a way that we can take specific chemical compounds that we need to get out of the blood, such as drug metabolites, excess hydrogen ions, or creatine from muscle cell breakdown, and get that out of the blood into the, to the filtrate and get it out of the body. So, class concept check. If glucose made it into the filtrate, it would have gone through, gotten into the filtrate or gotten there through a urination, micturation, reabsorption, secretion, glomerular filtration, or B, a reabsorbed filtered nutrient. Go ahead and rewind this video to get me an answer, or you can check your notes, the textbook, or your PowerPoints. Pause it and get me an answer right now. Five, four, three, two, one. One, if glucose made it into the filtrate, the glucose would have gotten to the filtrate through glomerular filtration. The only spot where we have glucose entering the filtrate is in the glomerular capsule as the glucose is leaving the glomerulus and entering the filtrate. We will never have glucose entering the filtrate in the proximal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule, loop of nephron, or the collection duct. Let's talk about the urinary system and homeostasis. Homeostasis, to review or refresh, is the main maintenance or maintaining a relatively constant internal environment. Even though the external environment our bodies are exposed to is changing constantly all the time. Our urinary system is a, aids with homeostasis, aids all other systems in homeostasis by maintaining blood chemistry. And by helping to maintain the blood chemistry, it will be able to help every system vicariously. If we look at the cardiovascular system, our kidneys help to maintain blood pressure, which is directly related to heart and blood vessel function. If we look at our digestive system, our kidneys help to regulate the amount of urochrome in our bodies. This urochrome is a byproduct of hemoglobin and bilirubin breakdown. If we don't have proper regulation of these, um, these chemicals, in our blood, we will have improper production of bile in our li liver and ex bile secretion from our gallbladder to help us emulsify and digest fats. If we look at our muscular system, our urinary system will regulate the amount of ions in the blood and the amount of glucose in the blood, which will influence muscle rate of contraction, which is the same for the nervous system as well. As we regulate the blood sugar and blood ion concentrations, we will regulate the nervous system function. If we look at our respiratory system, our respiratory system is a um, works in conjunction or works with the urinary system to help regulate our acid base balance. Our urinary system produces renin, which is a hormone or a component of the endocrine system. And it also produces EPO, erythropoietin, which is another component of our urinary system. And these, our urinary system can change vitamin D into a hormone and help process that hormone and send it to the rest of our body. It's also worth emphasizing that our urinary system is going to help remove some chemical compounds that are also removed in other places of our body. For example, within our integumentary system, we will secrete water, sodium, chloride, and other dissolved mineral ions, and ure urea and uric acid onto the surface of our body. And we can also get rid of those chemicals through our urinary system. More specifically, if we look at the kidneys as individual organs, our kidneys will help us regulate nitrogenous waste within our bloodstream, help us to regulate the water salt balance and ergo the blood volume and blood pressure of our bodies. It'll help us to regulate acid base balance or pH of our blood, and it'll be connected to many other systems of our body. We need to highlight the juxta glomerular apparatus. Juxta is a prefix that means that we are going to be that the thing that something is going to be compared side by side. What is it going to be right next to or side by side to? It's going to be right next to the glomerulus. So the juxta glomerular apparatus is right next to the glomerulus.
This is a structure that occurs right where blood is going into the glomerulus and then coming out of the glomerulus. So, or passing by the glomerulus. So we have the afferent arterial carrying blood into the glomerulus, and then we have the distal convoluted tubule that touches up against this afferent arterial. And what does the juxtaglomerular apparatus do? It will regulate blood pressure by secreting renin. In response to low blood pressure, we, our juxtaglomerular apparatus will, will release the hormone renin, which then is going to travel to the adrenal cortex and cause aldosterone to be released. What does aldosterone do? It causes us to reabsorb more sodium ions, specifically sodium ions, from the filtrate and take those sodium ions and dump them back into the bloodstream. As we have more dissolved salt in the bloodstream, we'll have more water sucked into the bloodstream to increase the volume and then increase the blood pressure. So we have our juxtaglomerular apparatus right about there, nestled right there in between our afferent arterial and the distal convoluted tubule. And when that juxtaglomerular apparatus senses that low blood pressure, it will release renin, which triggers the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. In addition to promoting the reabsorption of sodium ions, it's also worth emphasizing that aldosterone promotes the excretion of potassium ions from our bloodstream. Um, this is one of the reasons why if somebody is suffering from already high blood pressure, they are encouraged to go with potassium-based table salt and potassium-based water softener pellets as opposed to sodium-based table salts and sodium-based water softener pellets to help to aid aldosterone. So aldosterone doesn't have to do as much work, so to speak. Another hormone that helps to regulate our blood pressure that's connected to the kidneys is atrial natriuretic hormone, sometimes also referred to as ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide. As its name implies, atrial natriuretic peptide or hormone is going to be released by the atria of the heart. And it's going to be released from the atria of the heart at when our blood volume increases too much. If we have too high of blood pressure, we'll release ANP or a ANH, and that's going to inhibit the production of aldosterone. If our blood pressure is too low, we're going to have more aldosterone released to raise the blood pressure. If our blood pressure is too high, we'll release atri atrial natriuretic peptide or atriuretic atrial natriuretic hormone to lower our blood pressure. These two hormones work opposite of each other in two opposite acting negative feedback loops. Now, how does blood volume and blood pressure, how are they related to each other and how specifically can they be regulated by the kidney? The, if we look at concentration gradients of dissolved chemicals or dissolved solutes, the higher the gradient the higher the osmotic pressure is going to be. And if we look at our kidneys, generally speaking, the renal cortex or the outside of the kidney has a lower concentration of dissolved salts in the tissues compared to the inside of the kidney, the renal medulla. And as the filtrate goes through the loop of nephron, it'll go to an area that's deeper and deeper and deeper in the kidney to an area that has a higher and higher salt concentration, so more and more water can be sucked out of the filtrate. Our, most of the reabsorption of water is going to be due to the salt or solute gradient at, that the filtrate is exposed to as it moves through the kidneys. One hormone in particular though, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, sometimes referred to as vasopressin, is going to cause the collecting duct of our kidneys, those collecting ducts of the nephrons in the kidneys, to specifically reabsorb water molecules directly. So if you are dehydrated and you really, really, really need to keep that water in your bloodstream, you can release ADH and specifically suck water out of the filtrate against its concentration gradient back into our bodies. So if we look at this process, we'll start off with the renal, uh, <clears throat> the renal corpuscle, and we have that glomerular capsule and the glomerulus. The filtrate is very dilute and will go through our renal tubules deep down into the renal medulla where we have ever increasing salt concentrations and deep down in the renal medulla we'll have lots of sodium or excuse me water sucked out of the filtrate as it were increasing concentrations and then as we're heading back up the renal excuse me the loop of nephron will have sodium ions removed sodium chloride removed from the filtrate 
so that we can lower its osmolarity and make it easier to suck more water out of the filtrate on its next pass down. How does ADH and alcohol and water levels relate to each other? How do these chemicals relate to each other? Alcohol, specifically ethanol, is a chemical that is not a well-known neurotoxin. Um, In other words, alcohol causes our brain to not function properly. I think everybody knows that. If you've ever seen anybody who's drunk, you've seen them under the effects of this neurotoxin. And one of the toxic effects of alcohol on the brain is it causes the anterior pituitary gland to not secrete antidiuretic hormone or alcohol, ethanol or alcohol inhibits ADH release. And as we have less and less ADH being released into our body or abnormally antidiuretic hormone concentrations in our body, our urine is going to become abnormally dilute and you'll need to urinate a lot more and because you are artificially urinating more than you would otherwise, your body becomes quite dehydrated. This severe dehydration is the basis behind a hangover that you typically will experience after a long night of overdoing it, with drinking too many alcoholic beverages. So what's the take home message from you? If you consume an alcoholic beverage, you should also consume one glass of water for every alcoholic beverage to help combat the fact that you are going to be artificially dehydrating yourself. How can our kidneys maintain an acid base balance? Well, we are typically going to do that through buffering in our bodies. A buffer is any chemical that resists a change in pH. So these chemicals can re, um, re, um, process extra hydrogen ions or they can process extra hydroxide ions. If extra hydrogen ions are added to the blood, the bicarbonate ions in the blood will bind to those extra hydrogen ions and turn into hydrogen or carbonic acid, this com chemical compound. If we have extra hydroxide ions added to the blood, bicarbon carbonic acid will then bind to the extra hydroxide ions and form a water molecule and a bicarbonate ion. So by having bicarbonates and by having carbonic acid chemicals in our blood, these two chemicals combined being dissolved in the blood at the same time forms a buffering system that can neutralize excess hydrogen ions or excess hydroxide ions and resists change in pH. In our brain, we can regulate um, our rate of breathing with our respiratory center. And this respiratory center can measure blood pH and blood oxygen and blood carbon dioxide concentrations. And this will re this respiratory center will regulate the rate of breathing that we have, but it doesn't directly maintain pH long term in our bodies. Ultimately, Long-term regulation of our blood pH is going to be respond or it's going to fall to the kidneys as the specific hydrogen ions are removed or added to the bloodstream. So if we look at the kidneys in our blood, you know, blood flowing through this blood capillary, and then we have filtrate flowing through this kidney tubule. If we need to make our blood more alkaline, so we have too much acid in our blood, we can take bicarbonate ions from our kidneys or from the filtrate in the kidneys and dump those bicarbonate ions into the blood. And those bicarbonate ions are basic ions. And if we have too much acid in our blood, we can take the acid directly from the blood, the hydrogen ions, sometimes it's referred to as a proton, sometimes referred to as a hydronium ion, take those hydrogen ions and dump them, boom, into the kidneys. This first process on the left is called renal or tubular renal reabsorption or tubular reabsorption, where we go from the filtrate to the blood. And over here on the left is tubular secretion, where we go from the blood to the filtrate. So, class, concept check. Which hormone causes more water to be directly reabsorbed from the filtrate? That is a typo on my part. I didn't mean direction. I meant directly reabsorbed from the filtrate. We have ANP, also known as atronadirect peptide, or in your, t your particular text from PowerPoint, we use the, the newer term, ANH, atronatriuretic hormone. I'm showing my age right here by using these older terms. We also have aldosterone, renin, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, oxytocin, and adrenaline. So go ahead and rewind the, the video to get me an answer. You can pause it, check your notes, or your text, or your PowerPoints. Get me an answer right now. Bye. Four, three, two, one. The correct answer is ADH. ADH will cause water to be directly reabsorbed from the filtrate to decrease filtrate vo or fil urine volume and blood volume, or excuse me, decrease 
urine volume and increased blood volume. I misspoke there. My bad. Aldosterone has a similar end effect, except instead of focusing on water directly, aldosterone will cause us to directly reabsorb sodium ions from the filtrate. All right, let's focus on kidney disorders or kidney diseases. There are many diseases that can affect the kidneys and the urinary system as a whole. Such disease states include diabetes, high blood pressure, aka hypertension, and some inherited kidney diseases are going to be the most common causes of renal failure or renal disease. Other things include some more localized infections. For example, if there's an infection in the urethra, this is going to cause the urethra to become inflamed. Usually this is going to be bacterial in origin, and this is known as urethritis. We also could have an infection of the urinary bladder, and this is called cystitis. Cis is a prefix that, C-Y-S is a prefix that refers to the urinary bladder specifically. If we look at pyelonephritis, this is going to be an infection of the kidneys, specifically an infection or inflammation of the nephrons within the kidneys. If you have too many dissolved salts in your urine, or your urine is too concentrated, sometimes those dissolved salts can precipitate out of solution or come out of solution and form hard granules in the renal pelvis. Those renal pal those hot granules sometimes will be there due to the presence of a urinary tract infection or UTI, or due to a large enlarged prostate, which eliminates. Um, the rate that you can void the chemicals out of your urinary system, or pH imbalances, or too much dietary calcium. Either, regardless of whatever the cause is, once those hard granules form, it's very difficult to get rid of them. Once you have those granules starting to form, they can grow very quickly. Now, you can pass the kidney stone. Generally speaking, to help pass the kidney stone, you need to drink lots of extra water. Two, make it so that you urinate more and push those kidney stones out. I have it on good authority from students of mine that I've talked to that have given birth naturally without anesthesia and that have also passed a kidney stone that passing a kidney stone is much more painful than giving birth. And if you want to find something truly horrifying, Google kidney stone and look at the picture of all those sharp, jagged, crystalline edges on the kidney stone and imagine that tearing its way through your urethra and ureter as it's moving its way out of your body. If somebody has extremely high levels of urea and other waste compounds or waste metabolites in their urine, that can be a condition known as ure urinemia. And this is a condition that is going to be associated with extensive nephron damage. In these situations, <clears throat> When the nephrons are not functioning appropriately, this is going to mean that the kidneys can no longer function appropriately and it will lead to systemic or body-wide homeostatic imbalances. So let's say somebody is suffering from kidney failure. What can they do? Well, the most obvious thing is get a brand new kid, kidney replacement. And uh, transplanting a single kidney has had a very high success rate. You could have someone go on periodic blood filtering. This periodic blood filtering is known as hemodialysis or just blood dialysis um, colloquially. And the patient will typically once a week be hooked up to an artificial kidney that is going to clean their blood for them. Or they could be hooked up to a continuous ambul ambulatory peritoneal dialysis device. In other words, they're hooked up to a portable dialysis machine that never stops filtering their blood. And they can carry it around with them while they're walking around. They're able to be ambulatory or walk around as their blood is continually being filtered by this membrane. Here's a picture of a patient getting dialysis on an artificial kidney machine. And as you can see, this machine, ooh, this is a big machine. You definitely do not want to walk around with this hooked up to you. It's a pain in the butt. There's a reason they include chairs. But the benefit of this machine is it can filter your blood very quickly and very efficiently and filter all of the blood in your body in a matter of hours. And that it does such a good job of filtering your blood that it can last for your blood chemistry can typically be maintained over the course of a week. Those continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis devices, or the CAPDs, filter the blood much slower so they can never be turned off. But the plus, or they can be, rarely be turned off, but the plus side is they are much smaller and much more portable. So, concept check class. A case of blankety-blank is when the urethra is inflamed 
usually due to an infection. So we have kidney stones, urethritis, cystitis, and uremia. Go ahead and rewind the video to get me an answer, or you can pause it and check your notes, PowerPoint slides, or your textbook. Five, four, three, two, one. The correct answer is urethritis, inflammation of the urethra. All right, that's all we have for our urinary system. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to post them on the course discussion board, or you can shoot me an email or swing by my office when you're on campus. Happy studies.